Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, growing tensions in the Middle East. The top concern, the possibility of a war between Israel and Iran. If the two countries do go to war, how could it affect the rest of the world? We have to understand that in a scenario where Israel needs to operate alone, there will probably be a regional war. And this regional war will affect the whole globe. It will bring recession, oil prices will go crazy. Everyone in the globe will feel that. And could America get involved? We'll take a look at the possibilities of a multi-front war in the Middle East. Protecting children from online predators. One organization puts out its list of dirty dozen businesses that don't protect children from sexually abusive content. Some of these are on for issues like easy access for ch of adults to children, which results in grooming and sexual abuse. Four months after a train wreck spilled toxic chemicals in East Palestine, Ohio, people there are still living with it and wondering about the potential dangers. Health concerns, how, you know, are we safe? We don't know. We'll show you how they're taking action to help calm those fears. We'll introduce you to two women who are part of a ministry outreach to the LGBTQ community. We're advocating for the right of people to leave homosexuality or any of the other letters. Uh, because we ourselves have experienced many of those things. See how this organization is helping people leave homosexuality and transgenderism. And 50 years after his father's historic visit, Franklin Graham preaches the gospel in South Korea. Those stories and more today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this half hour with the mounting tensions in the Middle East with questions of all-out war with Iran in the center of it all. A number of experts believe such a conflict would go far beyond Israel and the region. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl takes us to the Israel-Lebanon border for a clearer picture of what's happening. The Middle East is experiencing a geopolitical shift with a number of potential outcomes. The prospects of a possible multi-front war uh, is bigger than it was in the last two or three decades. Has been many, many changes. But a decision to go to war from the Iranian side or Hezbollah, it's not that simple. Reserve Brigadier General Amir Avivi says he believes Israel still has deterrence. But we might also have a war if Israel feels that it's time to deal with the nuclear military capabilities of Iran. Avivi says he sees it going one of two ways. We have to understand that in a scenario where Israel needs to operate alone, there will probably be a regional war, and this regional war will affect the whole globe. It will bring recession, oil prices will go crazy. Everyone in the globe will feel that. The other involves America building a Middle East coalition against Iran. Show leadership, stabilize the region, pose a credible military threat against Iran, and then we might be able to stop Iranian aggression stop their program without needing a full-scale war. He feels America lacks a major element to make that happen. Guts, leadership. I think that on one hand, America is looking at China and Russia and seeing them as the big challenge. But uh, I think that there needs to be an understanding that if America wants to build deterrence back, and this is needed, because if without that, we'll see eventually China attacking Taiwan. We'll see the Russians being more aggressive in Europe. We need to build this deterrence. And he sees the best route to that is by targeting weakness. And the weak link is Iran. And by challenging Iran, America can build again deterrence globally. And this is, I think, what should be done. And this also will bring peace with Saudi Arabia that might be also extended to Pakistan, Indonesia, Oman. This can have huge advantages. Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi says Iran's strength, however, can be found in its proxies. Iran is providing the ideology, is providing the money, providing the training and providing the ammunition to Hezbollah and other proxies in the region. Why they are doing that? The part of the Islamic Revolution values uh, to annihilate the state of Israel. Zahavi says while Iran's terror network isn't ready to move forward yet, it's been busy preparing. In the past few months, we have seen the propaganda of Iran focusing on what they call the multi-front uh, against Israel, creating uh, proxy militias like Hezbollah in Lebanon, also they are uh, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Gaza, inside Israel, 
and to create attacks against Israel from all these places. She adds the various proxies don't appear fully united, as we saw during the recent conflict in Gaza when Hamas refused to join Islamic Jihad against Israel. Zahavi sees a difference to the north with Hezbollah that could mean two possibilities. One option, this we already see, is that they are willing to raise the tension on the Israeli-Lebanese border and to carry out more attacks. It already happened. The second option is that they are trying to drag Israel into war and that way draw the attention and even draw the efforts, if you like, from any thought of doing something against the Iranian and nuclear program. Avivi says Hezbollah needs to understand what it's up against. I think that sitting here overlooking Lebanon, there needs to be a clear message to Nasrallah and to Hezbollah. Israel is by far, far stronger. And if we are challenged, at the end of the day, we'll go in, we'll go fast and we'll destroy Hezbollah. He also urges the Middle East to consider the devastation in Lebanon as an example of what happens when Iran takes over. You can see that everywhere the Iranians take control, the place is completely destroyed. This is what the Iranians bring with them, destruction, poverty, misery. And it's time countries in the Middle East realize that and deal with them. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Israel-Lebanon border. Here's a quick look now at some of the other important stories making headlines here in the United States. James Comer, the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, is moving ahead with plans to hold the director of the FBI in contempt of Congress. Comer says the hour-long briefing he got Monday from bureau officials about a document that committed that the committee subpoenaed that deals with allegations of a bribery scheme involving President Joe Biden. Former Vice President Mike Pence has filed paperwork to run for president. And former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, along with North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, are also expected to run. Former President Donald Trump still holds, though, a commanding lead in the polls over the growing field of Republican candidates. I want to turn now to a critical story beyond the headlines. Protecting children from online predators is the key to keeping them safe. A leader in the fight against sexual exploitation says big tech is part of the problem. As Charlene Aaron reports, the group is calling out companies it says facilitate, enable, and even profit from policies that put your children at risk. The list dubbed the Dirty Dozen exposes businesses that fail to protect children from sexually abusive content. The goal is to motivate consumers to call on corporations, government agencies, and other organizations to change their policies and practices. Oftentimes, these are platforms that we use every day and might not realize that they have policies or practices that enable um, sexual harm. Companies on the 2023 list include the Apple App Store, popular social media sites Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter, eBay, as well as the digital music service Spotify. Haley McNamara, vice president for the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, wants parents to know how easy it can be for their children to be targets in their own home. Some of these are on for issues like easy access for ch of adults to children, which results in grooming and sexual abuse. One that might be particularly uh, applicable to parents and surprising would be the video game um, and platform Roblox, which is used by millions and millions of children around the world. Um, and unfortunately, it's very easy for predators to gain access to children on that platform. Other platforms um, are social media, um, focused, such as Reddit and Twitter, where unfortunately there's a large amount of child sexual abuse material or adult uh, non-consensual sharing of material as well. She says while awareness is important, this Dirty Dozen list also serves as a tool for child safety activists with a track record of getting companies to change their ways. While these are dark issues, there is so much hope because we have every year victories from the Dirty Dozen list. So in some recent ones include we got Amazon to stop selling childlike sex dolls, which they were selling in the past. We've had progress from Walmart, the Department of Defense, Verizon, United Airlines, and so many other companies that have improved their policies thanks to people taking action through the Dirty Dozen list. Moving forward, McNamara hopes for even more progress, especially when it comes to protecting those most vulnerable.
I really hope that we can have more uh, responsibility put on technology platforms themselves to make their products safe or to turn um, products safety on by default, at least for children. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Coming up, the residents of East Palestine, Ohio, are living with the smell of burning rubber and chlorine every day. The question remains, though, how toxic is it? We're going to take you to the site of the train accident that started it all when we come back. February 4th, a train derailed in the town of East Palestine, Ohio, spilling toxic chemicals. People there are still fearful of the air they breathe and the water they drink, and the cleanup could still take months. Some locals are now taking action to calm fears, including an unusual matchup between a pastor and a plumber. CBN's Brody Carter reports now from Ground Zero. This is a heavy-duty gas mask. We brought it just for safety. On the other side of this building are the train tracks. That's where they're digging up the soil, and you can really smell a burning rubber, a chlorine scent that's in the, in the air. Over here, families forced to endure that smell, and it's ridiculous to think that they'd have to wear a gas mask just to protect their families. Um, to me, it smells like kind of like a burning plastic. Smelling odors doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have health effects. Health concerns, health, you know, are we safe? We don't know. As you can imagine, talk around East Palestine, Ohio, remains centered on February's derailment and chemical spill. We're estimating somewhere between 60 and 100,000 tons of contaminated material are going to come out of that area. So it's, it's significant. You could just see the flames. They were higher than the house when they evacuated us. About half of the town's 5,000 residents evacuated after the accident due to a catastrophic failure in the train car's overheated wheel bearing. And so really this is kind of a miracle that it happened where it did. Concerns remain centered around the safety of drinking water, air quality, and contaminated soil. The fear of the unknown, however, could be the biggest worry here in East Palestine. I look at my son and his wife who just bought their house and are raising the grandchildren, and I just wonder, is this a good place for them to raise them now? Those who want to leave can't because trying to sell a home or business has become so difficult. We've been here 17 years. Dwayne Doyle, owner of Doyle's Fresh Meat in Delhi, knows the frustration all too well. He had planned to sell the shop and retire with his wife. Then the unexpected happened. They were just afraid of the unknown, and so they decided not to do it. This is as close as we can get to the actual train derailment. You can see behind me more than two months later, Norfolk Southern and the EPA working together to clean the ground soil next to the train tracks. Locals tell me if this were to happen any closer to the town center, it would have been much more devastating. By the grace of God that nobody was killed or hurt, you know, and I hope that in the long run, it works out for the town. Only now it's a waiting game to measure the long-term impact of dangerous chemicals left behind in the air, water, and soil. There was over 900,000 pounds of vinyl chloride in, um, on, in this rock. It's our job to make sure that anything that may be left behind is, are not at levels that could ever be a health concern to residents or to the ecology in the area. The EPA will be on site for months, helping clean and monitor toxins while shipping contaminated soil and water to deep well injection sites. We inject the contaminants several miles into the earth um, that uh, will never be accessed again by human hands. Just want my kid to be able to drink out of the hose one day. Folks like Zachary Schultz are looking for long-term solutions for the people who live here. This covers like, your whole house. We just don't have the research to be able to tell you that it's at a safe level to drink it. Schultz is working with a nearby church to use an anonymous donation from Texas to buy and install roughly 70 carbon water filtration systems for homes in the affected area. We saw this as an open door for God to do something and for us to tangibly love uh, those people that are around us. Yeah, we don't drink a whole lot from the faucet directly. Sue and Randy Dunlap are one of the families getting a filter. While there's no guarantee it can remove all contamination, they hope some protection is better than nothing. You don't know what you don't know. You just got to make a choice and say, OK, this is what I'm going to do. For some, this has become a crisis of uncertainty due to the long-term impact of the derailment and spill. Pastor Saveco, though, sees a resilient community leaning on their faith that God will heal their land. As East Palestine residents look toward the future, he seeks to reassure them that God is their refuge and strength, 
ever present in times of trouble. Houses can be replaced, jobs can be replaced, uh, but people, family, relationships can't. And through all of the, this, there hasn't been one loss of life. And so that's just incredible in and of itself. So I think that's a focal point where people are readjusting their values. Reporting in East Palestine, Ohio, Brody Carter, CBN News. Still ahead, they were blamed for a shooting at a gay club in Colorado, but that's not stopping them from praying for the victims. We're going to show you how these Christians are reaching out to the LGBTQ plus community right after this. And Edward and Christy Summers are part of an outreach to the LGBTQ plus community. Both women are Christians who left the gay lifestyle a long time ago. Following a mass shooting at a Colorado nightclub, they extended love and support to grieving men and women, even though some of them were blamed or blamed Christians for that massacre. CBN's Mark Martin brings us this story. The Colorado Springs gay nightclub known as Club Q remains closed due to a mass shooting there that took the lives of five people. A memorial remains in the form of poster-sized tributes to the men and women gunned down in November. I see the pictures and I see their faces and, and it reminds me of all the people that are missing them, all the people that knew them and are grieving them and will continue to grieve them for the rest of their days. It's very, very sad. We listened well and then said, hey, you're hurting pretty bad, can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. And she immediately said yes and put her arm around me, I prayed for her. Ann Edward and Christy oh, Summers, who are oh, part of Restored Hope oh, Network, Lord. ministered to those grieving after the Club Q shooting. The organization consists of a coalition of ministries, pastors and counselors John, across the U.S. who help people walk happy. out of the homosexual lifestyle and transgenderism. We're advocating for the right of people to leave homosexuality or any of the other letters uh, because we ourselves have experienced many of those things. Both Anne and Christy left behind the gay lifestyle after years of struggling. Anne believes her experience equipped her to minister more effectively after the shooting, especially when angry accusations began flying. What I did find is that people believed it was somebody who was from a different worldview and perhaps a Christian. Some of them immediately blamed focus on the family, though there was no basis for that. So it was really important to be there and care for the individuals and show them what Jesus looked like, not just talk about him. There is still a churning of um, an assumption that Christianity had something to do with that. Following the shooting, the Christian organization Focus on the Family, based here in Colorado Springs, experienced backlash in the form of vandalism. Graffiti declared that the blood of the victims is on the hands of the ministry. In response, Focus on the Family President and CEO Jim Daly issued a statement saying in part, this is a time for prayer, grieving, and healing, not vandalism and the spreading of hate. Focus on the Family is privileged to be one of many organizations in our city positioned to help and support the needs of struggling individuals and families. I know there were some stories online that mentioned focus on the family. There's this narrative that's developed over the years from the mainstream media that what we believe about sexuality, God's good design for sexuality, that that leads to hatred and violence towards LGBT identified people. And, and you know, nothing could be further from the truth. According to defense court filings, the Club Q shooter identifies as non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. Interestingly enough, um, you stopped hearing as much about focus on the family after the shooter, his lawyers identified him as non-binary. Like Ann and Christy, Jeff Johnston too left homosexuality. It doesn't mean you never struggle again or you're never tempted again, but the temptation is not like what it was when I was a kid, and the struggle is not the same. God has brought a lot of healing and transformation and victory into my life, and I'm just so grateful to him and to the church for that. In terms of how Christians can offer help and minister when two very different worldviews exist, Jeff, Ann, and Christy offer advice. I think people were grieved about this shooting, and most people don't know what to do about it. And I think the best thing they can do is if they know somebody who is gay, lesbian, transgender identified, is just to reach out with love and comfort and say, I love you and God loves you. And if you ever need anything, um, 
come and talk to me. I think it's really important for believers to interact with people in the LGBT community, not first about sin, but rather about their need for Jesus. What are the deeper, bigger things happening in the person's life? Are they really, truly at peace with God? Are they at peace with themselves? We have to be willing to see our own prejudices. We have to be willing to look at ourselves and go, okay, now, Lord Jesus, what is it that I need to repent from? What beliefs have I been holding on to that really aren't true about the LGBTQ community and what they are experiencing and what they are going through? There's pain in the LGBTQ community that I think is not always understood by the Christian community. Mark Martin, CBN News, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Evangelist Franklin Graham preaching the gospel in South Korea, marking an historic anniversary of a crusade by his father. We're going to bring you that story when we come back. Stay with us. In Seoul, South Korea, a message of peace as evangelist Franklin Graham preached the gospel to 70,000 people. The Saturday event honoring the 50th anniversary of his father, Billy Graham's historic crusade in the city. More than 3 million people attended the five-day 1973 crusade, including more than a million at the final service. The ministry reports some 72,000 made decisions to follow Christ. Around 5,700 churches took part in this weekend celebration of that service. True to his father's ministry, Franklin Graham preached a gospel message. More than 6,400 people committed their lives to Christ. Time now for your Tuesday Tweetable. This is a message I pray will bless you, and I encourage you to post, tag, tweet, and share it with those in your circles of influence. Faith is seeing it before you see it. It's also vision, and it's required to live a Christian life. So if you see it before you see it, act like it's so, speak like it's so, live like it's so. With that word, make this a terrific Tuesday. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel at any time, as well as online. That address is CBNNews.com. We'd love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us the address right there at the bottom of your screen, newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make this a terrific Tuesday and join us right back here, same time tomorrow. Goodbye, God bless.